फाइव प्लस सी के शर्मा फॉर द ओपनिंग रिमार्क Thank you, Kalpana. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you all to this workshop on multiple hazards caused by strong earthquakes to dams and the pertinent structures. As you are aware, in the month of September, we started this series on earthquake and dam safety. This is the last lecture, fifth lecture uh, by Dr. Martin Wieland uh, in that series, and. Uh, you know as you are aware that on in the first week of december <coughs> india passed dam safety bill and with the passing of dam safety bill responsibility of dam owners <coughs> has been directly uh, dam owners in fact are directly responsible for the safety of the dams so it is important that we equip ourselves with the latest knowledge <coughs> when it comes to earthquake when it comes to the seismic hazards as you are aware when it comes to dam safety uh, usually we think that dam safety is related to the body of the dam so if you have a very strong dam design a dam which is very strong and uh, it can withstand the earthquake at the same time we have to take care that uh, the equipment within the dam is capable of withstanding that earthquake So the safety of critical components and equipment is equally important. <coughs> and even if your dam and your uh, like the equipments installed within the dam uh, are safe, uh, then comes that what is the hazards uh, about the abutments? Suppose the dam is safe, yet on the abutments there is a rock fall. All your gates they get damaged. and the their tunians they get damaged you will still have problem and uh, you can't save your dam in the event of an earthquake and suppose the gates do not operate then uh, again you are endangering your dam similarly it is the <coughs> reservoir slopes also uh, reservoir slopes though they are important in the entire length of the reservoir but uh, especially in few kilometers upstream of the reservoir they are more important because the, uh, in case of the failures of these slopes the wave which is created within the body of the reservoir can even overtop the dam <clears throat> so all these hazards are really important for uh, all of us uh, to understand them, their implication to understand what has happened and how we can save our dams even if structurally it is safe it has to be safe from all other angles as well uh, <clears throat> in this particular case as uh, dr martin wieland is uh, not new to any one of us <coughs> he has been a great friend of india but yet uh, i consider it as a sacrosanct duty to introduce uh, dr martin wieland dr Ma martin wieland is <coughs> chairman of the committee on seismic aspects of dam designs of international commission on large dam since 1990 Ladies and gentlemen, he is the longest-serving chairman of any committee in the I Cold. <coughs> Until 2015, he was also chairman of the Earthquake Committee of Swiss Dam Safety. <coughs> he is a dam senior dam and earthquake expert at Afri, Switzerland. Formerly, it was known as Poiri. He obtained his MSc and PhD from Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, Zurich. in the year 1971 and 1978 respectively <clears throat> from 1980 to 1990 he was faculty member with the division of structural engineering and construction asian institute of technology bangkok <clears throat> from 1978 to 80 he was also associate faculty at of uh, swiss federal institute of technology <clears throat> well <coughs> sorry uh professor wieland is structural advisor board of kanama canal authority member of the structural advisory board uh he is also in the panel of experts of large storage dams in colombia ethiopia iran latvia pakistan papua new guinea 
Sudan and other countries. Uh, he was advisor of the newly established Dam Safety Directorate of Government of Ethiopia. Well, uh, Dr. Wieland has worked on 115 dams throughout the world in 35 countries. So you can imagine that how diversified experience Dr. Wieland has. He received his honorary professorship from Hawaii University in Nanjing in 2002. Visiting professor at China Three Gorges University. He is also a distinguished adjunct professor at Asian Institute of Technology, Thailand. He has authored about 300 technical papers in fields of dam and earthquake engineering. So, ladies and gentlemen, you can imagine the type of expertise Professor Wieland has. So, I will not take much of the time and <clears throat> I will not like to stand between you and Professor Wieland. So I now request Professor Wieland to take over and uh, deliver this uh, course on uh, hazards, uh, multiple hazards caused by strong motion or strong earthquakes. So Professor Wieland. OK, uh, Mr. Sharma, uh, thank you very much for your very kind introduction. And I would like to start right away. Sorry. Uh, can you see uh, my slide? Yes, sir. OK. OK, once more, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. OK, it's uh, quite early here in Switzerland. It's now 6.45. OK, uh, today is the last workshop. It's workshop number five. And the subject is multiple hazards caused by strong earthquakes to dams and appurtenant structures. And I would like to give a quick overview on what has been done up to now since uh, September 2021. First, we have talked earthquake and dam safety in October on seismic aspects of dam design. Also in December, um, we have talked on reservoir trigger seismicity and dams on fault. And uh, also in December, we talked on seismic safety of existing dams. And today, as I said, we talk about multiple hazards and uh, I would like to give a quick overview of what we have basically discussed. Uh, the Committee on Seismic Aspects of Dam Design of ICOS has published a number of guidelines on different uh, uh, dam uh, subjects. I have uh, marked them here. We have uh, uh, bulletins which were dealing with the seismic hazards that is dams on faults. We have uh, discussed that reservoir from seismicity is also related to uh, seismic hazard. These are uh, special hazards applicable to dam projects, which you do not face, I must say, with uh, other types of uh, structures, with building structures or bridges. Then uh, we discussed uh, on uh, bulletin 148, which I think is a very important one, which is concerned about seismic design criteria because they have changed and it has a, a large impact, let me say, on the most people who do the analysis and who, those who have to confirm uh, basically that the earthquake safety of the dam is OK. Now, um, we have also discussed, uh, let me say, uh, previously, on the design aspects of dams, okay, what are the best uh, design features to arrive at the dam which will behave uh, favorably during strong earthquake? Now, today, uh, basically, on these uh, in, in this list of let me say bulletins, we will discuss on dynamic analysis also because dynamic analysis has been a subject, of course, also of some of the previous ones. 
and uh, we'll talk about uh, earthquake design and evaluation of structures are pertinent to dams, which is related to design and inspection of dams following the earthquakes. So these are the red marked bulletins are a kind of a reference uh, documents of the presentation which I'm offering uh, today. Now, what are the presentations which uh, I have uh, proposed for this workshop number five? So I would like to start, this is now I'm just doing that on the introduction. And in this connection, I would also like to say a few words about dam safety management and the risk assessment. Afterwards, I will talk about hazards affecting large dam projects. Number three, I would like to talk about damage of second root buttress dam in Iran, which was caused by a magnitude 7.5 earthquake already 30 years ago. Then um, I think this will be uh, tomorrow or this afternoon. I will talk about um, heightening of concrete dams. I will talk about dynamic stability analysis of gravity dam. Number six, I would say a few words about uncertainties in seismic analysis of concrete and embankment dams. And last, I would like to uh, present, uh, uh, let me say, a discussion on models of earthquake ground shaking. So that is a proposed uh, program. I would like to say from these um, subjects, some of the subjects um, are let me say, uh, I, I have provided PDFs of all these presentations. Uh, the new ones are one, two, three, and uh, number seven. But uh, the presentations of four, five, and six, they were, it was the intention to make these presentations in the previous workshops but due to time constraints, it was not possible. So therefore, at the end of uh, this workshop uh, today and tomorrow, I would like to uh, also present these subjects uh, of uh, previous workshops. So you should have got already all of these uh, uh, PDFs of all these seven presentations. So that is the overview on uh, on the program today, and I would like to say, in a, as an introductory comments, I would like to say a few words about dam safety management as we see it. Uh, let me say in a uh, in a proper in a, in a way which we have uh, uh, or in an environment in uh, in Switzerland where this has been. Uh, very successful. So if we talk about dam safety management, I would like to remind you that dam safety includes actually several elements. I have uh, mentioned it uh, already a couple of times, but I feel it is uh, very critical that you are aware that for large consequence projects, you need actually also a sophisticated safety concept. And I would say a, a state of the art safety concept includes, of course, the structural safety. I just, just reminded once more that is uh, the design according to, to code regulation guidelines and earthquake and flood criteria methods of seismic analysis. Uh, second point is dam safety monitoring. You actually have to look uh, and to verify that your uh, project performs as planned. So you are doing that by visual inspection and by providing in proper instrumentation and do a periodic uh, interpretation of these results and to prepare annual reports. Number three, operation safety. That means uh, uh, one needs guidelines for reservoir operation under usual. This is a standard practice and which has probably not been done every, <coughs> everywhere. It is also under unusual 
conditions and it is obvious that uh, for operational safety you need qualified staff and you need uh, continuous maintenance which is very uh, important and last but not least we have emergency planning so you need emergency action plans in a case of some abnormal events and uh, in this connection in order to save people who could be affected you would need a water alarm system as well as in addition uh, you need some engineering backup <clears throat> i think this is essential <clears throat> sorry <coughs> Engineering backup is quite essential because some dam owners do not have uh, all this expertise and if some events occur, it is necessary that somebody actually can tell the dam owner if this event is actually a dangerous one or it is a harmless one. Because some people who see some crack in, in some uh, concrete dam, they may be frightened and uh, I must say, if uh, some experienced people may look into that, they may come up with a different assessment. So um, engineering backup, I must say, is quite important. It has become important in Switzerland because the dam owners were under pressure to reduce their staff. So they reduced their uh, engineering staff. So therefore, they no longer really had um, the engineering expertise and if you reduce your staff but then you must still have access to people who really know these subjects. Now uh, as an example which has been very successful let me say in Switzerland uh, I would say <coughs> the dam safety inspections and dam safety management in Switzerland consists of, and I would just like to show it how we have been doing it, and uh, it is uh, a system which has worked for over 50 years, so I would say it is uh, quite a good system. <clears throat> so um, what we have, we have different levels in this uh, dam safety management and in dam safety inspections, uh, different levels which I would like to uh, go through quickly. Level one <coughs> is the responsibility, What uh, I should say what is given in this case, uh, in this um, uh, table we have on one hand we have the different levels of uh, responsibility, then we have uh, people who are responsible to do this work, then it is a short description of the activities and then is the result of these um, activities. And if we start first, the owner and, and his dam safety engineer or technical staff are responsible for regular inspections of the dam con condition by visual observations and by observing the behavior based on measurements and they have to do tests of spillway and bottom outlet gates. So this is the responsibility of the dam owner and every year they have to compile the monitoring re uh, records and to um, uh, provide the corresponding test protocols. This is the level one, which is, I, I must say, this is uh, it's very obvious that this is being done by the dam owner. When we have a level two, if we come into the inspection, then there is an ex experienced engineer. It is a civil engineer, and he is looking into the measured data recorded by the owner and, uh, and he's doing an annual inspection of a dam. 
Okay, we, we say we do an annual inspection. I've been in the, in the Philippines, people there do this inspections more than once a year with independent, uh, uh, let me say, experts. But we, we say one year is enough here because some dam owners already may complain about the extra work they have by doing all these uh, inspections in which they are not so much, may not be interested in that that much. They will probably not do it uh, voluntarily if somebody will not ask for it. Now, uh, what is the result? This is a yearly report on the condition of the dam and on the measured behavior of the dam. So that is a level two. This is the annual inspection. Then we have, and this is done by one person usually. It could be done by two persons, but usually the budgets are not uh, adequate. So it, of course, it would be better to have more than one, but uh, basically turned out in our case, it is being done by one expert and maybe for in uh, exceptional cases uh, there are two experts who are doing the level two work and this engineer here experienced engineer he is not an engineer from the um, from a dam owner he's an independent engineer okay number three level three is um, the responsibility are experts is a civil engineer together with the geologist. Okay, let me say why do we have a geologist? Because uh, Switzerland is, is mountainous, like here in the north of um, India with a lot of mountains. So therefore you have a lot of geo geological geohazards. So therefore the safety assessment is being done by the civil engineer who takes the lead in association with the geologist who has to take care in what uh, uh, Mr. Sharma has just mentioned in, in, in the introduction on the stability of the slopes at the dam site, stability in the reservoir area and maybe even in the catchment area. So he would have to look in this uh, aspect as well as offered into a foundation um, of the dam project. What is uh, what are the act activities? They are doing an inspection. Let me say it's a shorter inspection than the annual one, and uh, they uh, review the dam safety reports here, which have been uh, prepared by the the annual report. And they look into uh, other safety issues. I would say, uh, for example, changes in uh, design codes, uh, changes in uh, new data, for example. A typical example would be uh, climate change. You know, you would. Uh, have some change, for example, in the hydrology, in, in, in the flood. So therefore, every five years, people are doing this detailed inspection where also changes and new developments are taking into account. As I say, a typical case is uh, would be climate change would fall in that, and today, we would also look into cyber criminality and some other new issues which uh, have come up uh, uh, recently. Uh, what is the outcome? It is a report on the condition and long term behavior uh, of a dam, and uh, they will analyze some special safety related questions, maybe some observations which have been made in the annual report may be looked at in a more greater detail and they may look here also as I said may address uh, in our case in Switzerland uh, it has uh, been in connection with uh, permafrost growing of permafrost increased uh, 
uh, mud flow hazards and so on. And it could also be special investigations on um, sedimentation and so on. Okay, there are, these are uh, project specific um, uh, questions which have to be addressed. And then there are number four. I must say these experts who are doing the five years inspection, this is what we have done in Switzerland, I've seen in Korea and in Malaysia, basically they use 10 years. Okay, we think it's a little long. Uh, of course, the more frequent you do it, uh, the better. Uh, but in some uh, parts of the world, they feel they have too many dams, so it would be appropriate to do it only every 10, uh, uh, 10 years. But I think five years is a good uh, period. And then finally, we have the dam safety authorities. I do not know exactly who is doing that in India, but the dam safety authority, they are also doing on-site inspections, review the annual report done on level two, and they do also the report of the detailed dam safety uh, review here on, on level three and in level two and three, a number of recommendations are usually being done and they verify if these recommendations are followed, which have been made by these experts on level two and three. Usually, uh, let me say from the dam safety authority, if the inspections take place, in a detailed inspection, they also participate at the same time, and sometimes they also participate in the annual inspections. Okay, so they check basically if the recommendations made in the annual and five year detailed inspection reports are actually followed, and if they are not followed, they make interventions. Okay, what are the interventions which the uh, government is doing? They impose a reduction of uh, reservoir level. Okay, they say if you do not follow these uh, recommendations or you do not answer to these recommendations, we request you to lower the reservoir level uh, by a few meters until these uh, uh, problems are resolved. And as you know, at, uh, as a dam owner, I must say uh, the most precious uh, capital you have is a, is a water in a reservoir. So therefore, uh, they are of course against uh, against any reductions in the reservoir level. And then, based on these interventions, I must say in Switzerland, it has. It is not known to me that um, a dam owner has basically uh, not followed these recommendations made by these um, independent experts on level two or three. So that is a concept we are using. I am not familiar with the concept uh, which are you using in uh, India, but uh, I must say uh, if uh, if you look into your uh, system, maybe to look also what is being done in other countries like in Switzerland, uh, it would be useful. Now, I am involved in one dam here, which is this arch dam, uh, is uh, Pumpal Gal, is in a Swiss national park. I have given some presentation already. It is a kind of a unique uh, project because the border between um, Switzerland and Italy is here. You know, this side here is on the Swiss side. This side where I took the photo is uh, Italian. Okay, so we have also this kind of, uh, of a problem, but there is an agreement, for example, for this project that the dam safety is done according to the Swiss safety regulation. So that needs some Agreement, so there is not, uh, there are not two safety inspections done uh, 
by Swiss experts and Italian experts. So basically, because it is a Swiss issue, so all people involved are Swiss people and actually no, non, no Italians are involved and they also do not get actually these uh, safety reports. But what I would like to mention, I'm in charge of that for the annual inspection of this dam. And usually it covers the period here, the last which has been finished is until October 2020. I'm now working on the next one until October 21. But I would like to draw your attention here. Number 50, this is, the, it is in German. It is the annual report number 50. So this has been, it has been done for, uh, you, you see already for, 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 in this project and also for the other project, it has been done for 50 years. And it is not something, um, um, something which has just been introduced. So what I would like to say is we have a long-term experience. Also this annual report, includes levels one and one, levels one and two. That means it includes the observations made by the dam owner and it includes the analysis of the data and the inspection done by the dam expert. Usually, uh, just to say for this dam is 130 meter by arch dam. We, just to, to give you an idea about how we are doing the inspection, the scope of the inspection is purely on dam safety. You know, so therefore the inspection is being done in one day. Even for this project, first uh, uh, we walk through these dams. There is a, a number of galleries. You walk through them, it takes about four hours, also dressed and so on. So half day you do the inspection and in the afternoon you have a discussion with the dam owner, and that is this um, inspection, the site inspection, it takes one day. Okay, yeah, because we have been involved in some other projects in Latvia, for example, where uh, the dam owner includes in dam safety inspections also many other items which are not really, which are not safety relevant, but they somehow according to their um, laws or guidelines, they have to look also in normal maintenance issues and so on. So therefore such inspections like we have done in Latvia, it, well, it needed much more time. It needed 10 times more time than uh, we are doing in Switzerland. I would say it is quite important. And of course, the cost is also 10 times higher. So it is quite important that uh, these dam safety inspections are not overloaded and they are focused on the dam safety. For example, here this uh, power plant is made for power generation, but we do not look into the power plant because the power plant has nothing to do with dam safety. So this is a different issue. We have to uh, separate those. Otherwise, you cannot do an inspection, uh, let me say, in a uh, efficient way, I would say, as we have been doing it in Switzerland, okay. Uh, <clears throat> this was the annual report. In addition, there is a five-year detailed dam safety report, which is also for this uh, dam, which has also been finished in 2020, which is uh, level three, and this is prepared by independent, as I said, by the independent dam engineer, civil engineer, and the similar report is being done by the geologist. As I said, there are in the mountains you have uh, you have to look in a foundation and you have to look in a reservoir ring and so on. I should also okay. So this is done by the independent um, uh, dam engineers. Okay, I just mentioned that there is the other report by another expert. This is the geolo geological report by an independent geologist, also covering the period 
of the five years here, level which I mentioned, which is uh, level three. So these are different, uh, let me say these are reports by different um, consultants. They are not people, uh, uh, people employed by, um, by the dam owner, but these uh, reports, let me say, eventually have all these um, inspections have to be paid for by the dam uh, owner. Some people have some problems with that because they say if uh, the dam owner is paying this independent expert, so the result may be uh, biased, but I would say uh, if some people have some, some people may have problems with that because the payment comes from the dam owners, but we do not have this problem. Let me say, okay, but somebody could construct some some uh, problem because because of this um, issue. <clears throat> okay, now um, if we look into the update of this uh, design criteria. Uh, let me say in a five years period, I would like to give here a few ideas about why do we need uh, periodic checks, safety checks for some of the, let me say, natural hazards. And uh, I, I would just uh, list it here briefly. For example, typical case, uh, this is now first on a flood, flood hazard. Uh, we should do some review if the new information on the flood hazard and or the land use in the catchment is available. Sorry, just dumped. Okay, if the dam has been subjected to a very large flood, I must say one should look at and if it may have even caused some damage to a spillway. If new Flood design criteria are introduced. How you can really release your uh, safety floods is a quite, uh, it has quite some big uh, impact. Also, if some new flood performance and safety criteria are introduced, for example, that you have to uh, uh, release. The, uh, let me say the safety flood, assuming, for example, in a hydropower plant that the power plant is out of operation and so on, and that not uh, all gates of a spillway are available, that some may be blocked. So we have this new, uh, let me say, criteria, safety criteria, which are. Uh, which have been changing in the last, let me say, 20, 30 years. Also, if new methods of hydrological and flood, flood routing analysis are introduced. Okay, this is uh, um, in estimating, for example, the probable maximum flood. Okay, there are new, new methods which have been introduced. If the flood vulnerability of the dam has increased, that means uh, if the capacity of the spillway, for example, is not addition, is not sufficient. If the flood risk has increased, I've just given here some example. Uh, if, for example, climate change, we have a higher, we may have higher floods, so therefore the flood risk may have increased or may be increasing as a function of time. And I would say even more important is probably in some parts of the world, the economical development and increased number of people staying in a downstream flood plain. So uh, there are a number of, uh, let me say, events uh, which require actually a periodic review of the flood safety. We cannot say that uh, a dam which is built today according to today's design and safety criteria will just remain safe for the next 100 or 200 years. Okay, this is a wrong 
uh, assumption, but some people have this kind of uh, idea. But I just mentioned here a new, a few number of um, events which require actually, uh, which have an impact on the safety and which need to be reassessed. Okay. Now, similarly, here we talk mainly about earthquake safety. We also need a periodic update and safety checks of um, of the earthquake hazard. And I mentioned already a couple of times that seismic safety evaluations of existing dams have to be carried out repeatedly during the lifespan of a dam. That means if it is lifespan is 100, 200 years, we may have to do uh, such safety evaluations every, uh, it's difficult to say, 30 or 40 years, just to give some idea. We do not have to do it uh, every year or every five years. We only have to do it if really have, we have new, we have changes uh, which may have an uh, important impact. So, for example, for uh, let me say climate change, we do not have to update every two years or five years. We may update only once in 20 or 30 years, once we have more data available. Okay, so uh, in the case of, uh, of safety, seismic uh, safety assessment, we should do it if new information is available on the seismic hazard. And uh, let me say we have put now more importance on the multi-hazard because in the in the past people only looked into ground shaking, so we may have some more information on other aspects on other hazards caused by earthquakes, or if some new information on seismic tectonics is available. This is I just had two days ago a discussion. In Indonesia, is a question on is a fault it is a fault active or not. It is a never-ending uh, also issue, but I must say there may be some new findings with respect to seismotectonics that uh, may be some faults which have been declared as inactive at the time of construction of the dam, maybe considered by some seismotectonic people as potentially active. So if we have this change, the consequences uh, are, are important and we have to look at it. Number two, if the dam has been subjected to a strong earthquake, of course, we, uh, uh, for example, this eventual earthquake in China, in 2008, I would say in China, people have used uh, quite small acceleration, peak ground acceleration, if I may call it like that, compared to other parts of the world and based on this event, I must say they have made a reassessment of the seismic hazard in that region or even in the whole of uh, China. Number three, if new seismic design criteria are introduced, okay, I, this is the I called ability in 148, I would say, which is related to seismic uh, aspects, and it is a new bulletin which uh, also covers different issues, some we will discuss today. If new seismic uh, performance criteria are introduced or safety criteria, uh, we allow now, as I said, uh, some damage in the dam body as long as the reservoir can be retained. We do not ask for, let me say, undamaged dams in the case of the strongest earthquakes, which some people felt if they are using the old concept, pseudostatic analysis, they felt uh, you can do it with uh, allowable stresses and so on. So the dam would be in, uh, would be undamaged. Okay, these are outdated concept which was mentioned also at the very beginning today. Now, uh, next point: if new dynamic uh, analysis methods are introduced, 
Okay, we know already the pseudostatic method is over, so we have to do a, a dynamic analysis, and there are different types of dynamic analysis based on a number of uh, assumptions. And I would say uh, the linear elastic analysis basically are settled, if I may call it like that. However, nonlinear analysis, some are still under development. They are only simplified nonlinear analysis, which I will also show, which are uh, already, which are applicable. Okay, if the seismic vulnerability of dam has increased, for example, due to aging or some other means, have some some modifications in a dam have been done. So therefore, the seismic vulnerability of a dam has increased. It is clear. I would like to present, uh, uh, I think, uh, later on, um, a uh, uh, the subject of dam heightening. It is clear if you hated the dam, an existing dam, uh, maybe the seismic vulnerability uh, will uh, increase. I must say, the safety is uh, decreasing. And if the seismic risk has increased, that means this is the downstream development of the dam. And if the risk classification of the dam has been uh, changed, because, because the risk classification is not something unique, in India, you may use some risk classification, which is different from that in uh, in Europe, or different from that used in uh, in China. If you change your seismic risk uh, classification of dams, it may have an uh, impact on the design and safety criteria. So there are a number of uh, reasons why a periodic check of the seismic safety uh, would be required and. Uh, why this has to be done, I must say, uh, uh, continuously. It has to be done. Uh, I would say the seismic safety check has to be done maybe every 30, 40 years. But these changes here, which I'm mentioning here, uh, have to be reviewed, for example, during the detailed dam safety inspections, which I've mentioned before, which has been in Switzerland, which has been done uh, every five years. Years. Okay, so uh, now let me look into the assets, and this is just uh, an introduction for, uh, for for the for the next presentation. Here, basically, we use for different hazards. We use a different. We use the so-called hazard matrix, or you can call it a morphological box or something like that. Uh, we have a natural hazard, structural hazards, and we have a man-made hazard. And um, what are the measures which can be taken? This is here on this uh, axis. If we have some deficiency, we can do a rehabilitation. We can do a partial, if it is more urgent, we can do a partial reservoir drawdown. Maybe this can even be asked by the authorities, as I said, if uh, the owner doesn't follow some instructions. Uh, we can ask for a full reservoir drawdown as much as possible for some events. We can ask for evacuation if that is possible and for some events. And uh, in some cases, we have only the possibility of post event evacuation or rescue, basically. So we have, for the different hazards to, to deal with these hazards, we have a number of possibilities which are listed here. And if we look, for example, in floods, we can do a rehabilitation. If we see the spillway safety is not enough, we may increase the capacity of the spillway. If uh, the hazard is increased in Indonesia, uh, sorry, in the uh, Philippines, we have this case that the flood uh, safety has been underestimated during typhoon. So during the typhoon season, the reservoir is lowered in, in one of the Hangar Dam is lowered, I think, by about nine meters. So as a precautionary measures, or 
if the flood, of course, comes, we have uh, initiate evacuation. This can be done in different uh, ways. In our case, uh, we have so-called water alarm system. But this would be an extreme uh, uh, flood event. So similarly, for the earthquake, of course, we request we could not. A, actually, we can put everywhere. Okay, we make a reassessment and we can make a, a rehabilitation. But rehabilitation is really uh, is more or less the exceptional case. There are just really some structures, some dams, which have really some deficiencies. Partial reservoir drawdown is not really what we can do, but what basically we an earthquake occurs immediately. We have done some, uh, let me say, early warning systems in uh, Istanbul and in Latvia, and it gives only warning times of less than 10 seconds. So, for with uh, warning times of 10 seconds, you cannot do anything. So, therefore, you can do, uh, if you, ex well, the, uh, the earthquake uh, occurs, you cannot. You cannot predict the earthquake, so you cannot do the evacuation. In a case of floods, you know, in, in some big rivers, uh, or if you have some special weather conditions, you can do some evacuation before. Post event, that would be with the alarm system. So we see here, if we look in all these possible hazards, also, I would like to draw your attention, if you look into a man-made hazards, criminal action, sabotage, terrorism, acts of war, or we could add cyber criminality, could add here. Basically, we can only do the post-event evacuation because these events are not predictable. It's the same with the earthquake. So therefore, if you look into the safety of tanks, not only on safety, also the class of nuclear power plants, the most critical hazards in the safety assessment of these structures are the earthquake hazards from the natural hazards, and they are criminal action, and they are sabotage, terrorism, and acts of war. They are the most critical ones. And uh, I must say, in most cases, if you look in uh, uh, nuclear safety, okay, I've worked also that people doing some uh, risk, uh, probabilistic safety analysis. Yeah, you, you cannot address that properly. So this is uh, kind of a big, uh, a big problem in a safety issue. So this gives you some overview on uh, on hazards and what you actually could do as an engineer. Okay, I've given here all I mentioned them already. The protective measures is quite important. You can do rehabilitation, partial drawdown of reservoir, drawdown to minimum reservoir level, preventive evacuation of population if you have enough warning time. Therefore, this has been the idea of, uh, let me say, Earthquake prediction, but I must say earthquake prediction, uh, it is a dream. It is not possible. I think it is one of the hard problems. Okay, I have been involved or I have studied, uh, let me say also this issue of earthquake prediction when I got involved in uh, earthquake, in, uh, in the earthquake safety of dams, and it basically turned out that in the last 50 years, the progress in the prediction of strong earthquakes, because we're only interested in strong earthquakes, uh, the progress has basically been zero, and it is not possible to predict these earthquakes, because the prediction of earthquakes, I would like to mention it once more, because there are still some people who feel they have to make predictions, and you do not have to read this uh, this kind of uh, report, it's uh, just, uh, uh, yeah, it is a kind of voodoo uh, science because the problem is you have to predict 
the magnitude. We are interested in a large event. You have to predict the time, and you have um, uh, the place. Three parameters which are very hard to predict. The skeptical assessment of the earthquake prediction, but as I said, but all this from time to time you read in the newspapers that someone predicts yeah, earthquakes here and there. Okay. And the last one is false evacuation and water alarm that means when the dam already fails. <laughs> uh, that you can uh, basically uh, rescue the people or that you can evacuate the people because it will take some time until uh, a flood wave from a dam bridge uh, propagates along a valley. Okay, the natural hazards are here, for example, flood hazard. I just read it here quickly. It shows in the flood hazard we can have overtopping, and the problem here is, of course, the floating wood. Here we have a, also in Switzerland, which is the dam which I mentioned, in which I was involved. There was some terrorism threat because it's at the Swiss Italian border. And in Italy, in the 70s, you have the so called direct brigades who threatened all kinds of also infrastructure. And they also threatened this dam. And you see here, these are the spillway, spillway gates here. And they gave here then this protective net because the road is just here, is about six meters away from here. So from the road, you could throw maybe some uh, some bombs or, or some hand grenades or something, and you could damage uh, some uh, parts of his gate. Okay. Anyway, somebody had threatened, so people have used this uh, a net made of high strength uh, uh, cables. Okay, so we, we actually had the case of this uh, um, terrorist uh, Threats at this uh, border. Uh, in the meantime, now about five years ago, this is an older photo, uh, has actually been uh, removed because this threat somehow uh, now with Italy it has disappeared. Now, also in this con uh, uh, connection, I would like to say something about risk analysis today. As you know, everybody talks about risk analysis not only today. Already for 50 years, also let me say. And I found, okay, risk analysis is uh, quite interesting. When I was a faculty member, um, before I had quite a number of students uh, who did uh, some uh, master's thesis on on different aspects of risk analysis, because it is a quite, uh, let me say, from the academic point of view, it is a quite um, Interesting reliability analysis and so on is, I must say, yes, it's quite interesting. But I have seen um, risk analysis in, uh, in dams. There are just a few countries who press a lot on risk analysis, and they are, in my opinion, the large countries. They are the USA, they are Canada, they are maybe Brazil, they are mainly. Australia and probably also in uh, in India, but in in Switzerland, uh, we we are not doing uh, uh, risk analysis. Really, the risk analysis. I will just show you this year, um, and I would give here an example where we have done, I must say, a detailed risk analysis for uh, a big. Um, for a main uh, hydropower project in Latvia, it's about 800 megawatt, is a runoff river power plant, consists of a, a, a spillway and a concrete powerhouse integrated and of some side dams. And in the risk analysis, uh, you have to look in the different types of risks. And I would just like to mention that for this. Uh, a dam consisting of a con concrete structure and embankment dams. It is uh, a, a risk comes from the operational of the spillway gates. 
the special type of spillway gates, which are used, uh, let me say, in the time of the Russian concept, I would say, also in China uh, for some time. When uh, there is a risk, that means the first is the operational safety here. Second is the lack of adequate spillway capacity. That means uh, design criteria have changed, safety criteria have changed since the construction of this project in the 1970s. Then there is some problem with the structural safety of uh, spillway piers. There's a problem of the risk of time overtopping, and there is some risk there also with some internal erosion here because it was on, uh, it is not fully founded on rock, it is on some in a glacial valley. Okay, so these are a kind of risks, and I would just like to say a few words about this risk analysis, because I mentioned risk analysis, uh, if somebody feels to be advanced, he says he is doing a, a risk analysis. Of course, there are different types of, uh, uh, the, uh, different people have different uh, opinions, and some people say this is the future. It is like uh, in the, uh, let's say, the nuclear industry, people think all is based on risk analysis or probabilistic. Uh, risk uh, probabilistic safety analysis. Okay, and uh, now what are the steps uh, in, in the risk evaluation of some projects? Of course, first we have to look what are possible hazards, and I will talk then about the hazards. We have natural and man made hazards, and I mentioned already earthquake hazard and terrorism and so on are both which are not predictable, so they are quite uh, difficult. Then we have uh, failure modes different types of failure modes, which I've mentioned here before. This can be evaluated in detail, uh, let me say, by so-called event trees. When we can do a risk analysis, we can do estimation of the conditional and annual probabilities of failure. Conditional uh, probability is, for example, for spillway gates. If a flood occurs, if a, if a hundred years flood occurs, what is the probability that you cannot operate the spillway as planned? That would be a so-called conditional uh, probability, and the other is the annual probability if you looked into uh, different types of uh, floods which could occur uh, with certain probabilities during an average year. Then there are so-called risk acceptance criteria. So you look into maybe with um, failure, stand failure uh, would uh, occur. You would have to estimate the people at risk. And you have to make an estimation of the loss of life and the loss of property, losses, environmental losses, cultural losses. Okay, there's an infinite number of uh, consequences. So what is, are the criteria here? And then the last one is the risk mitigation. And here we talk about so-called structural and non-structural measures. And I would like to give just a, a quick uh, uh, introduction into this uh, uh, problem. What are the consequences of dam failure for a worst case scenario? Okay, the consequences are, are very much. They are loss of life and injuries. You have environmental damage, property damage in the floodplain, damage of infrastructure project in the floodplain. We have loss of reservoir, loss of power plant, and loss of electricity product production. This is a, a risk. That, uh, this is uh, directly related to the business of the dam owner. So this is a kind of an internal risk. And then we have a socio-economic impact political impact, okay, all kinds of uh, things. If you have a large uh, uh, flood disaster, okay, some poli pol politicians will ask, will be asked to resign and so on and so on and so on. But the main priority, I must say, is for the government. Is if they look in the dam safety, 
they want to prevent the loss of life and to minimize uh, the number of injured uh, people. They are not so much, they are not too much, they are not really concerned about the loss of reservoir and uh, they are not uh, uh, so much interested in the electricity production of okay, the because it will not directly uh, cause loss of life. Also, the loss of reservoir, if it is used for irrigation, you may not be able to irrigate, you may have a, uh, a drought and so on. So it is a little interlinked, but the main, uh, let me say, objective for the government is, in our case, is to protect lots of, to, to protect lives. These are the possible consequences. Okay, this is uh, this project I mentioned in Latvia, uh, where we did this detailed risk assessment, looking into all aspects. Uh, it is a 800 megawatt uh, plant, it's a quite high, and you see here we, we, there are about 10 spillway openings, and then I was there, uh, there was a spring flood, and uh, they were in the process of opening the spillway gate, and you see these are not ra radial gates, which we usually have, which you could operate remotely, these are gates, these are flat gates, which have to be lifted in place by these uh, gantry cranes. These are huge cranes, which take away these uh, gates and they store them here on the abutments. Okay, one is opened and of course the question is, if a flood occurs, a hundred years flood or thousand years flood, what is actual probability that these cranes are operable because these cranes are essential for opening this gate. So I would say this is a, a concept which has been used then at the time by the, I would say, which is uh, was quite common in a case of Soviet uh, based power plants because Latvia was part of the Soviet Union at that time. And this Slavina's power plant, I think, originally was called Lenin power plant. Okay, so uh, we have here the spillway structure and we have here on the side, we have the side spans on both, uh, on both sides. Okay, so we have to look into this uh, safety. So there is a question of the safety of operation of these uh, cranes to actually open the spillway gates. It is quite, uh, it is very an essential safety component. So therefore, also for the seismic safety, you see here it's a huge mass at a quite uh, high, uh, uh, let me say, center of mass. So therefore, if you have some si seismic events, uh, you, you may have some safety problems here. You may have some problems with uh, electric power supply, emergency power supply, and even emergency, emergency uh, power supply, which is uh, provided, which is very critical. I must say here in Latvia, when this time was built, uh, nobody took uh, into account earthquake uh, action because seismicity in this part of uh, the Baltic states in this region is uh, quite low, but it still has to be taken into account especially when these structures actually are very vulnerable to earthquake action. Okay. So this is this uh, system. So let me say, uh, discuss here just two of these possible failure modes, uh, which have been considered geotechnical failure modes. Actually, this project is founded on, uh, let me say, glacial deposits. Uh, let me say during the last ice age, this area was about uh, under 1,000 to 2,000 meters of ice. It was covered by huge ice, so you have a lot of uh, uh, deposits from this uh, glacial, from these glaciers. So, and uh, you have a difficult hydrogeology with artesian uplifts everywhere. 
okay, it makes it a, a little difficult. And uh, if you have artesian pressures, it is clear so in the foundation of this uh, concrete structure, it's also powerhouse is, is integrated. If you have high uplift pressures from artesian pre from, from artesian pressures, the sliding stability will, will drop quite a bit. So therefore, in order to uh, control the uplift pressure, a number it is basically here in this location, a number of so-called relief wells have been uh, drilled in order to lower the uplift pressure, lower this artesian pressures. It's uh, and I must say this project, it was not easy. They drilled about a thousand boreholes, but only five could be used as relief wells. So the question is, if you have a blockage of relief wells, your uplift pressure will increase a lot. And if your uplift pressure increases, your sliding stability decreases, and some people doing some uh, pessimistic assumptions have seen uh, this power plant already floating down the river. Okay, it's a little exaggerated. Okay, and uh, there are also some problems with internal erosion. Is uh, item number two uh, is uh, because it's a sandy material and uh, it has been weathered. So there is some removal of sand in a in a foundation into the relief wells and which basically is similar to, uh, let me say, uh, internal erosion. Okay, there are another, uh, a number of other uh, failure modes, uh, geotechnical failure modes, but I would just like to show how we could, for example, address this issue in, in this special case. And I must say, if you do this kind of uh, risk analysis, of course, uh, the um, possible failure modes are different in different projects. So we cannot really uh, generalize what is given here, but I'm explaining here because this is one of the projects which, where this has been done uh, in great details and we have uh, had quite a big budget in order to do all these uh, investigations. Oh, uh, let me look into the stability. This is a failure scenario, sliding stability of a powerhouse, railway powerhouse. Okay, we are only seeing uh, in the top portion some story. Okay, and, and you see this is the upstream side. So we have a water pressure here. We have some. Uh, uh, some concrete uh, apron, we have some pressure acting here. We have on the uplift here on the foundation, and I've said here we need the effect of the uh, uh, relief wells in order to control this uh, artesian uplift. And if this artesian uplift is not controlled, this uplift pressure increase, so it reduces the sliding stability in the downstream region. So that is just the kind of the uh, load assumptions which have been done for the static stability analysis. Now, <clears throat> now if we look into the failure, if we want to do the risk analysis, we have to, to do some uh, what I called uh, event trees. And uh, the initiating event is that due to some reasons, we have a blockage of almost all the relief wells. What is the probability? It's the annual probability is uh, maybe 0.02. If, if they uh, are blocked, there are two possibilities. The uplift pressure begins to increase under the powerhouse. Maybe 20 percent probability. The uplift pressure does not increase. It's 80 percent, so the, the, the time is safe. Now, if it is the pressure 
increases, you have the possibility with uh, remedial measures. For example, if you have time, changing filters, drilling new wells, and so on. And if you are not able to do that, remedial measures fail, uplift pressures continues to, to rise. It is assumed the probability is about 0.3. That's the given number I have removed here. It is 0 0.7, of course, here. This one here is a 0.7. Now we have to follow here if we are fail to control the uplift pressure. The powerhouse becomes unstable. Powerhouse remains stable, about 95%. Here is 5% chance. Here, when the powerhouse becomes unstable, we have to make an emergency drawdown of the reservoir by opening the spillway. If we can do that, it is okay, the plant is safe. If the emergency drawdown cannot be made in time because of failure, of these uh, gantry cranes, which I've mentioned. Uh, this, of course, uh, depends on uh, different assumption with the spillway. We assume they're about 0.5. And uh, for reducing the risk, we, uh, for that project, we also uh, studied the effect of additional spillway capacity. If you have this additional spillway capacity, or additional reserve spillway, if you may call it, it was assumed to 0.1. And uh, if this uh, cannot be done, this re release, we have maybe no dam bridge, bridge, or we have a dam bridge. Okay, so the probability of failure is the initiating event multiplied with 0.2, multiplied with 0.3, multiplied with 0.05, multiplied with 0.5, multiplied, sorry, multiplied by 0.5, and this gives here the probability of uncontrolled release of water. This is, I must say, this is a very, very simple uh, event trees. I must say in other industries, of course, you have much, much longer event trees, even in seismic hazard analysis, people are constructing event trees. I've been in a, in a project with 10 different experts, and every expert gave his own estimates. So what we have here multiplies by a factor of 10. So at that time, we arrived at, if you would go into a different path through this event trees, uh, it would have been about 10 to the power 23. So they need special techniques uh, to, to go through such uh, trees because with normal computers, we could even not calculate it. Okay, anyway, but what I want to say here, in, in this civil structure, the event trees are basically very, very elementary and there is much depends on these estimates. Okay, this is, I must say, is based basically on engineering judgment. These are, may also have uh, very large uncertainties. But it shows what is the idea about uh, different failure scenarios and the corresponding uh, event trees. Uh, similar event trees can be done for hydromechanical failure modes. What is, what is given here only the summary it goes with the, uh, uh, let me say, uh, a lot has to be done with the power supply here. And there are many different uh, failures. What is given here with the failure is a power supply. If you want grid, okay, different, in, different power supplies uh, are not available. Here it gives some probability that these cranes are not functioning, then we can have a problem with the rails of the cranes. We can have problems with, we have two cranes, with crane one, crane two, and we may have uh, problems with gate lifting. 
that uh, the gates may be, um, let, let me say, uh, may, may be blocked. You, you, you cannot. You cannot open it due to some reason. Anyway, and if you look into that in the event trees, you will get a failure, different probabilities of failures, and the, the total here, different failure uh, for, for, for different uh, event trees, which I'm not showing it, but uh, you have to add them all up, and we got here an annual. Uh, probability of failure. So sorry, we are yes, we get the conditional probability of failure here of 10 to the power. Minus two, that means a, a, probab a probability of 2%, basically, that these gates do not work. In addition, we have um, hydrological failure modes. I must say all that look about the same. If you look, for example, this is also for an event. If we, if we look into the 10,000 year flood, what occurs? If we look into a powerhouse in operation, powerhouse out of operation, spillway in operation, spillway out of operation, uh, spillway in operation, we have overtopping, and we could have breach, and all the black dots here indicate scenarios where we will have overtopping or Overtopping means here, overtopping of the embankment dams on the side means basically breach of these dams. So we have, if you look in the probability of failure due to a 10,000 year event, you will get, you would have to sum up all these uh, resulting probability of failure. Okay, sorry, it just jumped. Now, we have done that, of course, for different floods to look what are the probability and then to look into the compound. Uh, probability of flood uh, safety, we look into 100 years event, 1,000 years event, 10,000 years event. In this case, because it has a very large catchment area, the 10,000 years corresponded already to the PMF in this case because most of the inflow in this river is quite a big river, comes from Russia. Big, uh, a very big uh, catchment area. And we in investigated the effect of extra spillway capacity. And we have seen if the 100 years flood occurs, the probability of failure is uh, 0.082 without uh, spillway. It is for a thousand years flood, it is 0.44, 10,000 years is 0.88. And if we use this additional spillway capacity, of course, we can reduce these uh, uh, probabilities of failure. These are, as I mentioned, conditional probability of failure if this uh, 10,000 years event occurs. So you see, with this extra spillway, it was it would be possible to reduce uh, the uh, probability of failure by about a factor of five. So that would be a result from the um, from, from the hydro hydrological failure modes. Now this here is a, just a, a kind of a, a summary of this uh, probability of failure. Because at the beginning we do not really know which is the most critical or, or uh, not. We found out that the hydrological failure modes are, this is the annual probability of failure, it's about 0.001, that means 0.1%. Geotechnical failure modes, you were considering, you see it's uh, almost a factor of uh, 10 uh, smaller, but the hydromechanical failure modes, this is now, Per event, that means conditional, is 0.02. So we have a probability of failure of 2% of any flood, and basically we have a flood every year. So the risk is, is uh, quite high. So these are quite some numbers. We know these numbers in a risk analysis, okay, they can vary quite a bit based on the 
assumptions which are uh, mentioned, uh, which are used in this uh, event trees. Uh, and uh, there in this project, there was, of course, also a panel of experts and the panel of experts had some hydrologists, some geotechnical engineers who feel their disciplines are the most important ones. So they basically are against these results. Okay, they were against these results yeah, because they felt their disciplines is the most important one. And uh, basically they felt this information is important, but is not relevant. Okay, it's a little, uh, also we spend uh, probably a million dollar or even more uh, on this very detailed analysis of there were about three power plants. And uh, at the end, the panel of experts felt uh, their disciplines are more important and there are so many unknowns in the the flood prediction, I mentioned already, yeah, at that time people did not really talk about climate change, but they said hydrology prediction is difficult. And the other one on the geotechnical said, we have no idea what is actually in the foundation. We know even less. So therefore, uh, it is uh, uh, very questionable to use this number. Okay, for us, it was a kind of uh, frustrating when we, uh, because we did this uh, this analysis, but uh, people, of course, can argue like that. So if you do some risk analysis, you know, there are some people who do not believe in the result, basically, and there are people who push you hard in the direction. Okay, so uh, let me, Look now into people in the risk of acceptance criteria, which is related to estimated number of lives lost if failure occurred. I think I've shown it once already. Uh, I must say, what is given here? Lives lost, and on the vertical axis is the annual probability of failure and uh, deeper event. Which I said, for example, before failure of the spillway in the event is 10 to the power minus 2, about 2%, we would be in a risk assessment. So we would be risk outside generally acceptable limits. So you would have to do, you would have to work uh, on, on that issue. And we see the risks, which would be. Uh, Still within limits are the probability of failures of 10 to power minus 5 and smaller. And of course, with decreasing, uh, let me say, uh, probability of failure acceptable when the number of people killed is uh, increasing. Okay, that are different countries are using this kind of. Uh, graphs. Okay, uh, in Switzerland, I would also just like to say, because we are not doing risk analysis, we say it is not possible to calculate the probability of failure of dams, so we do not look into this, but we want to look into the consequences. We want to take measures to reduce the consequences and the objective, let me say, this is, uh, is of course also kind of a dream, but this is the vision uh, in Switzerland is that in a case of failure, the number of loss of life is zero. We do not accept that. We, we would not dare to talk, to show somebody that we would accept this kind of, of, of losses. So we say the objective of a government is zero. So we have to take action that we can do, uh, that we can achieve is zero, and that means we have to put a lot of efforts in emergency uh, preparedness. 
different action plans. So this is maybe quite different, but in, uh, in countries like US and so on and so on, uh, people like to use this kind of uh, diagram, but we have a different uh, idea on that. Now, okay, I, maybe I uh, just briefly risk mitigation measures, what can be done. We can do the downstream risk reduction. As I said, we are basically in Switzerland, we are only doing this. Risk mitigation, we look into the downstream risk reduction. I think this has really a, a quantitative, you, you can quantify that. You have a direct impact. So that relates to structural measures and non-structural measures. And on the other hand, we want to have a dam risk reduction. That means uh, the safety probability of to reduce the probability of failure. Okay, probability of failure. We are doing that by the monitoring, of course, and by uh, what shall I say, operation safety of the dam. But uh, we do basically not feel we have to strengthen the dam structurally or hydro hydrologically, but operational okay, would be a separate, separate one. Okay, so uh, basically we are working on this side and on, on this side, but we do not think that it is possible to calculate the probability of failure. We can calculate the probability of failure, I must say, just for a few events, okay, we can do that, for example, for hydraulics, as I've shown before, we can make uh, an assumption. But this is for a na this our natural environment, but if you look in the dam safety as such, it's basically look, taking into account terrorism acts of wars and so on, it is not really possible. Now we have two, two ways of reducing the consequences of a dam failure. And we are, as I said, we are working on that. Basically in Switzerland, we request or we have about 64 so, uh, early warning systems. They are called water alarm systems, which are uh, installed in all dams or dam cascades. So with the early warning, if there's a dam failure, we have also some special sensor to detect the uh, dam failure. Uh, we can warn, we think we can warn all people living downstream of the dam. But uh, okay, on the paper, I must say, but we, we think this is the way to go. Then number two, uh, we have to prepare internal and external emergency action plans. This is uh, necessary. I think you should also do it for your existing uh, dams. Then there is uh, land use planning in a floodplain. Okay, uh, we had some case uh, people were uh, building a, a water treatment plant with hazardous chemicals in, in, a, in near the river. So we basically told them it is better to uh, to build this water treatment plant uh, 20 meters higher up, then it would not be affected by a flood plain, uh, a flood wave caused by breach of a reservoir. And we have some operation guidelines that means rule curves for reservoir during normal and extreme conditions. So these are the non-structural measures, and I would say these non-structural measures. I would say they should be implemented because they cost very little. Well, almost, yes, they cost very little. On the other hand, uh, okay, these were a few, just to sum, sum up then, internal and external emergency action plans, water alarm, operational guidelines um, for normal and uh, um, abnormal conditions, and also during, uh, uh, different types of works, operation guidelines for rapid lowering of 
of the reservoir, uh, lowering of the reservoir level, periodic safety checks, training of personnel, engineering backup to cope effectively with abnormal and emergency situations, land use zoning, and our non-structural measures, and checklists for maintenance and repair work. So I would say these are non-structural measures, which, uh, as I mentioned, are basically, yeah, they, they do not cost much, except I think the, the most expensive would be a, a water alarm system with some sirens, typically in Switzerland. I think it may cost about one or two million dollars for each dams. Now, what are the structural measures for risk reductions? That means for improvement of the structural safety or for reducing the probability of failure. So uh, we do an improvement of the operational safety of spillway gates by backup lifting equipment for each gate and redundancy in power supply. So you really do that something. So uh, it will cost something. Here in that project in Latvia, which I've shown before, we propose additional spillway to increase the, the flood safety, but this additional spillway, what we need is there about 3,000 cubic meters. It, it costs about uh, 250 million uh, euros. You know, it, uh, additional spillways, it, it becomes, uh, it, it, it really, it is not a small amount of money. Now, uh, there, in the case of Latvia, there was a plan to replace of relief wells by new relief wells distributed over a larger area so to increase the safety. But uh, I must say the, the, the situation, hydrogeology is quite complex because people have studied this problem already for 40 years. First, uh, during the Soviet area, at least during uh, 20 years, and then uh, in the, some Western experts, including us, uh, have also studied it for another 20 years. So, but uh, the solution has not yet been found. There are a few problems which are not so easy. Rehabilitation also of some of some joints. Okay, at this time, uh, basically uh, in uh, in the Western countries for water tightness of joints. We use uh, water stops, but in the, uh, let me say, in Soviet uh, built power plants, they often use uh, bitumen filled joints. They are called weather, so they even have needed some heating of this uh, bitumen. So uh, this would be, uh, let me say, non structure uh, structural safety measures. And it is clear if you implement them, some of them. Well, are affordable, but some additional spillways also it has been proposed more than 10 years ago. It has not yet been built because these people do not have the money or they are still looking for money because it needs uh, a large uh, amount of uh, money. Now, uh, what are the safety criteria of a dam and spillway? I would just like to say, to give you some uh, idea and then to give some reference to what we know from structural design of buildings, bridges, let me say non dam structures, non hydraulic structures. There, basically, in the design, we consider two so called limit states. Number one is the ultimate limit state. And in uh, ultimate limit state, we look into the safety of our structure. For a dam body, this means we have to uh, control the sliding stability of the, the body. Let me say here of this uh, spillway uh, power plant structures for various scenarios, including uplift, earthquakes, and so on. With artificial pressure there, number two, and we should be able to, in this, this is now related to this project in Latvia, we should be able to control internal erosion processes because there have been some events occurred where 
10 or, or more cubic meters were suddenly released and over 40, 50 years of operation, uh, maybe uh, several hundred cubic meters of sand have been uh, displaced. So therefore this missing sand comes from somewhere and uh, it, it could come from some uh, internal erosion processes. And number two, operation safety, that is the second uh, limit state. It is a so-called serviceability limit state in structural engineering. And you know, serviceability limit state in structural engineering is, for example, for reinforced concrete structures, it is mainly the allowable crack width, and it is basically allowable uh, deformations in order to protect, uh, let me say, on structure in buildings. Okay, but here in a power plant, the serviceability limit state is are related to the operation of the power plant. So therefore, uh, the settlements of the powerhouse must be controlled, controlled and also the rate of settlement, because if you have, uh, let me say, uh, differential settlements, your turbines may trigger. Okay, that means they uh, may shut down automatically if it exceeds, or it may even be damaged. So you accept only extremely small amounts of uh, differential settlement. So the serviceability in state here is second number one, uh, what I mentioned here already, okay? Because the turbine and generator, if the turbine axis uh, is out of the alignment, it also creates uh, large vibrations. So this is uh, the example which I wanted to show you uh, uh, first on, I must say, on this lengthy introduction on, on dam safety, dam safety management, the practice we have been using successfully, I must say, for 50 years in Switzerland. And if you are speci specifying something, uh, if you ask some consultants or so to do it, they, I would say usually they will overload uh, the uh, objectives of these, uh, let me say, safety checks. And if you do that in Latvia, we have done that. They have greatly overloaded that, I've told them. In Switzerland, we are not doing that. But when uh, the dam owner has to pay 10 or 20 times as much as uh, he would have to pay in Switzerland for the same work. Also, these countries don't have much money. So, uh, so, so with the scope of the, uh, the, the scope of this, uh, let me say, uh, safety evaluation uh, is, have to be, have to be limited. Okay, do not extend it to everything. It's not good when the final conclusion will be that many dam owners, those who cannot create big benefits, like those for irrigation projects, they, as a function of time, they will discontinue doing this uh, safety reviews. So it should not be overloaded. Okay, this is number, number one. Number two is with the risk analysis. They, okay, people go for risk analysis uh, and it is in to do the risk analysis, but to do it actually for some dam projects, it is a quite, uh, uh, quite, uh, what shall I say, uh, uh, still quite simple and it needs, unfortunately, well, um, it needs a lot of engineering judgment. Therefore, the outcome of such risk analysis being done by uh, different experts may vary a lot. And uh, I must say it is also, it is my personal uh, convention. Yeah, because when I started working with uh, the company A3, it was then called Electrova. Electrobat Engineering. Uh, I was in charge of uh, a 
business year, well business unit uh, uh, a section, which was uh, related to risk. We, we had in the title of this um, section was also given uh, risk and reliability or, or risk. Okay, risk analysis. But um, as a consultant, my uh, conclusion is now as a consultant, if I, if I speak from that point of view, is the clients, they do not want to have risks, they want to have safety. So basically, uh, the conclusion was that in my unit, we, uh, after realizing that we, uh, we have cancelled the word risk analysis, and basically we, we only like to talk about safety, also, the people doing the risk analysis, they repeat it uh, a million times that there is nothing which is 100% safe. Okay, but in, uh, in the dam industry, we talk in safety and therefore we use the concepts of uh, worst case earthquake scenario or maximum credible earthquake and we use the concept of PMF, probable maximum flood, and the idea of these terms is that if your dam is safe for these extreme events, there is actually no event which is uh, larger than those extreme events. So therefore, your dam is safe and you do not have to talk about uh, risk. Of course, most people doing the risk analysis, they oppose this uh, kind of concept, but in the, in the dam industry, we are still using this concept, and I think it is much easier to tell the people that something is safe, and they feel confident, than to tell, it, to tell them the risk of failure is 10 to the power minus 5. Nobody knows what this means. Okay, so therefore, my, uh, I'm convinced that as a consulting engineer, we uh, sell safety and not risk. But we know, and I would like to say that, that any structure which has been built by man can actually can be destroyed by man. So if somebody says, uh, uh, there is nothing which is absolutely safe. Of course, it is true. If you drop a nuclear bomb on a project, it will be destroyed. So there is nothing absolutely so safe. But to uh, let me say, to to criticize the concept, and there are, I must say, I have seen that people criticizing the safety concept used in. Uh, in the dam industry used up to now, and I think it is a good concept, is a, is a better concept than the safety concept used in other industries, even including the nuclear industry, where people only where people like to talk about risks and actually people who are affected do not know what the meaning of this uh, risk is. So I think we have reached already uh, uh, the time of the uh, of the first session and I would like them to continue I think in uh, two hours I understand uh, with the uh, second session of today where I give an overview on all possible hazards which may affect the large dam uh, project so if you have any any questions, uh, please, uh, please feel free. Sure. Sir, uh, there are two questions so pertaining to concrete dam. Uh, then uh, first is, uh, what should be permissible deflection in the concrete dam? Is there any guideline in this regard? And second one, what should be the permissible settlement of the foundation in case of concrete? So, should you go to the next one? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
मैसेज भी भेजा है सर मेल भी भेजा है तीन तीन बजे तीन बजे फिर से होगा सर तो तो फिर आपके पास लिंक है सॉरी जस्ट वेरी क्विकली डिफ्लेक्शन ऑफ कॉन्क्रीट टाइम ओके यूजुअली वी वुड से फॉर फॉर ग्रेविटी टाइम देर आर नो अलाउल डेफोमेशन But I would say the deformations are only in the range of a few. Uh, let me say, depending on the height, of course, we talk about a few millimeters, maybe one centimeters, or, or, or let me say, very few uh, centimeters. And for gravity dams in our parts of the world, most of the deformations are actually not due to the water load, are basically due to uh, to the uh, temperature effects. Temperature difference between winter and summer. Now, for large arch dams, I must say uh, we have down to 150 meters high. We have about 18 centimeters, so you can have 10, 10, 20 centimeters. And the seismic one would also be in the range of, uh, if it is done on a linear elastic analysis, it could also be in the range of uh, 20. 20, 30 centimeters, but we do not have a ratio where we say eight uh, deflection over eight is one over thousand or something like that. Okay, I've not yet seen these numbers, but we would like to have a small, uh, small values. So this is uh, not really, a, uh, let me say, uh, <laughs> a clear answer. I know it. But we we uh, design it in a way that it should be small. The, the second one is is the settlement. Uh, the settlement I am is for for a concrete dam. Okay, for for a concrete dam. Okay, the settlement uh, would depend on uh, what is the problem. If the settlement would be non-uniform settlement, and uh, if your foundation stiffness Is maybe not uh, very high. There is one dam, RCC dam in Turkey, where they had a relatively low modulus of elasticity of the foundation, which they caused uh, some offset in uh, construction joint uh, of block joints, construction joints, and also cracks in uh, the RCC dam body because the Spacing of constructions at joints in the RCC dams is relatively large. So therefore, I must say, uh, if you are on weak foundation, uh, you, you you may encounter uh, some some problems with gravity dams. But I must say, arch dams should not be built on weak foundations. So this should be discarded because these dams would be even more vulnerable to uh, a foundation settlement. Of course, if it would be a settlement as a rigid body, it is not critical. What is critical is basically the uh, the differential settlements, non-uniform settlements along the footprint uh, of uh, of the dam. But if you look into the settlements. I must say, what is allowable? You would uh, you you do it based on your analysis of the dam foundation system, and then you will see already what are the kind of stresses which are caused by, for example, non-uniform uh, um, foundation uh, displacements. Okay. Sir, uh, this uh, uh, permissible deflection is uh, should be dependent on height. So, can we give some uh, angular value, uh, which is independent of height, uh, for uh, deflection? Yeah. Okay. I, I have not yet seen these values, so I cannot give you a, a recommendation. So, I cannot find any recommendation in any literature regarding this uh, deflection and settlement, permissible yeah. settlement. 
probably you can find, but I have not researched it myself. So I, I actually do not know. I would I, I, I would have to look into that, but I know, let me say, uh, from Switzerland. And we built the Gotthard railway tunnel. It's uh, 57 kilometer long. It was completed uh, uh, relatively recently. And during the construction of this tunnel, it was below three arch dams, but at a depth of about 2,000 meters. But it was in, uh, let me say, not far from the axis of the tunnel. So by the excavation of this tunnel, people have expected some, due to changes also in the hydrology and so on, groundwater table and so on, and also due to some deformation, some deformation at the dam crest, uh, at, at the dams, and therefore they installed, I must say, very sophisticated, was also very expensive, uh, uh, a dam monitoring system based on theodolites, automatic theodolites, which have measured, and I must say for the arch dams, the allowable deformations were given there. This is for the foundation movement was given for, I think, six centimeters for the empty reservoir and eight centimeters for full reservoir. For full reservoir, we have given a higher allowable deformation because the water load puts the arch under compression. So uh, you could allow a little more deformations until critical tensile stresses may develop. So, uh, that, uh, that that would be for for arch dams, but our uh, but this for this special case. But in a design, I have not really. Uh, people have just calculated what is the maximum uh, uh, deformations, and uh, it was important basically that the stresses under usual load combinations are within uh, the allowed of stresses. That means you do not develop cracks in your concrete structure. So that was a more of a limiting factor. Thank you. OK, is there any more questions? Otherwise, I understand that you want to go for a break. Can, can I ask uh, a small input? Yeah, please. Uh, you have said that uh, annually you make reports and that's a great thing and there must be 50 reports on an annual basis. And if uh, like if there is a change in the criteria or some changes happening, it's fine. Because of that, there must be changes in the report reflected by the experts. Otherwise, uh, is there is there a study which shows a comparison, like ten reports of five yearly duration and fifty reports of yearly duration? What kind of uh, expertise uh, reflections are there? Is it because of the change in the experts that reports change, or it's uh, because of uh, otherwise also? Uh, you find a change in the reports, or they are stereotypes. Okay, in in the detailed um, inspection, people are doing also uh, long term uh, reviews. For example, to see how the deformations have changed over, let me say, twenty years, or how the uplift or the seat pitch. Okay, these are some of the parameters how they have uh, changed uh, as a function of times. So this is being done just from based. Uh, this is related to uh, monitoring data. Then there is, of course, a much longer record. There is every five years, there is also a geodetic survey being done of these dams, and these go back to the uh, time of construction. So these records are actually even longer both from a geodetic survey were those which have been done from a very uh, a very uh, beginning. Now, um, 
let me say if there are some changes, people do not look into the historical uh, changes or, or or multiple changes. I think, but they will in in a design criteria. But we will look, of course, if there are some uh, modifications in uh, in um, in in the dam structure. So. Uh, as I said, if in a detailed uh, design, let me say in a detailed inspection, people think there is some evidence of some change in the hydrology or that um, maybe the uh, land use planning has been changed and so on. So they recommend that the new hydrological study is being carried out. Not these experts are doing this study. So the dam owner then will be requested to ask some consultant to make a review, for example, of the of, of the flood uh, of the flood risk. And uh, this has been done now, for example, in in a project which I mentioned there uh, for this arch dam. Uh, it uh, it was about 50 years old, so people. They asked for doing a review of the hydrology of this dam, and it turned out that actually using the modern methods and using the the actual records, because you know, at the time of the, of the construction of the dams, the, the length of the records were limited. Now we have longer records, and it turned out that actually the 10,000 years or the maximum of the safety floods today were actually even smaller, slightly smaller than those used at the time of uh, design. But of course, when it is smaller, you do not reduce the safety. So, so based on the flood safety, no changes were done. Also the flood safety, let me say, um, or the, the safety flood, actually the intensity of the safety flood has um, reduced. So oh, it, it is, a, I, I must say, it is a case by case uh, study. I don't know if it answered your question. Oh, no, thank you. Okay, is there any more comment or question? Otherwise, Mrs. Uh, Kalpana. Dr. Tareja wanted to ask one question. Hello? Yes, I hear. Dr. Tareja wanted to ask one question, please. Yeah, I have. I have already asked. Okay, okay, okay. Because hand... uh, he has replied. I'm, I'm happy that uh, you know. Uh, okay. What... He has replied already. Thank you. If there is no more question, then I think uh, this session we can close. So we can break for lunch. Dr. Martin, we can break for lunch. Yeah, it is good, yes. It's, uh... So we will again reassemble at 3 o'clock. Okay. It is fine for me. <laughs>